When the next earthquake hits, will you be ready? Hi everybody, I'm Val Zavala. Earthquakes are a fact of life here in California. In fact, small quakes rumble through our area pretty much every day. And the experts tell us there's a 99% chance that we'll see a major quake, at least as big as Northridge quake, in the next 30 years. It's not a question of if, but when. So it just makes sense to be prepared, and we're gonna help you. The program you're about to see is called Bracing for a Quake. It's a nuts and bolts guide to everything you need to know and all the smart steps you should take to protect yourself and your loved ones. And I'm very proud of the show. I hosted it with my colleague, Jason Schultz. And when we first put it together a few years back, there were no smartphones and no social media. Many things have changed since we first produced the program. Technology has obviously improved and schools can now send emergency notifications via text, voice, or email. In addition, the Red Cross Emergency app has an I'm Safe feature, which allows users to let loved ones know that they're out of harm's way. Also, earthquake insurance has become much more affordable and flexible, with new deductible options ranging from 5 to 25 percent. Some of the spokespeople in the program have retired or moved on, but the information they provided was rock solid, and it's every bit as important today as it was then. So I think you're going to learn a lot. You're also going to meet an expert from the California Earthquake Authority. We'll have him here in studio, and he'll take the mystery out of earthquake insurance and a whole lot more. Right now, though, I hope you'll take a moment to support your public television station. Call the number on your screen or log on to our secure website and make a tax-deductible contribution because you're the reason we create important programs like Bracing for a Quake and so many other programs that you'll find right here and no place else, on the air, online, 24-7. We're the source for public media with a purpose, and we can't do it without you, so please get in touch. And now it's time to get smart about all that shaking going on as we present Bracing for a Quake, a survival guide. Across California, from big cities to small towns, we've seen what happens when the earth moves. Bridges in the Bay Area collapse. Levees near Sacramento can flood. Freeways in Los Angeles have split open. Central Coast towns crumble. And homes from San Diego to Eureka are ruined. The jolt can last a few seconds, but the impact can last years. Yet experts know there are many things we can do to protect ourselves, our loved ones, and our property. So what should you do when the big one hits? We'll tell you in Bracing for a Quake, a survival guide. Hello, I'm Val Zavala from KCET Public Television in Los Angeles. And I'm Jason Schultz from KVIE Public Television in Sacramento. Welcome to Bracing for a Quake, a survival guide. If there's one certainty about life in California, it's that we're going to experience an earthquake at some point. Many have experienced one in the past and have taken the necessary steps to prepare for the future. But many of us still haven't gotten ready for the big one. But where do we start and what do we do the moment a quake hits? That's what this program is all about. We'll talk with experts about how to prepare your home, what to do if an earthquake strikes when you're at work, out shopping, or even in your car. We'll also help you formulate a plan for your family and your neighborhood. So let's get started. We begin with an expert on earthquake preparedness and a visit to the Martinez family. Joyce Harris is with the LA County Office of Emergency Management. Hello. Hi. <laughs> how are you? Fine. Good. For years, she's been helping people and organizations prepare for earthquakes and other disasters. Well, Joyce is here to size up the Martinez home, beginning with the living room. Okay, I'd like to show you a few things in this room that I noticed that can be corrected. Um, first thing is you have a sofa right by a window. And we don't recommend that because you only have a, a few moments to react when an earthquake happens and the glass from the window can break and, and uh, you could be injured by having it so close. So what we would recommend is that you move the sofa away from the window to make it safer for you. Okay. Another thing that I've noticed in this room is that uh, you have some very nice items here on, on your shelves, uh, but they need to be secured so, they, so that they won't fall over and break during the quake. And it's very easy to do it. You can use some um, museum wax or even some putty or what they have an item called quake hold that you can use. And all you have to do is put just a very little bit of it underneath the item and it will secure it in place. Another thing I've noticed is a picture frame. These are beautiful, it's a beautiful picture, but it needs to be secured to the wall. Um, you can use some flexible nylon um, straps or you can use um, 
anything like that that would help secure it in place so that it doesn't fall over and hit someone as if they're in this nearby area when the quake starts. Okay, I'd like to show you something in this room. Nor now, normally we would tell you to drop, cover, and hold under a sturdy table or desk. This is a beautiful table, but there's one problem. It has glass on it. And so we would not recommend that you take cover here because the glass can shatter from things falling on it and you could be injured by uh, being under here. But we do recommend that you go to a sturdy table or desk and take cover there whenever an earthquake happens. Wouldn't it be easier just to run out towards the door? Uh, no, we do not recommend going outside, uh, no running at all, because you could be thrown to the floor during the shaking. And if you try to go outside, there lots of things will start to fall from the building, from your home or for other building that you're in. And that's where you can get your greatest injuries is from running out into a hazard zone, we call it. So if you're inside, stay inside. If you're outside, stay outside. And don't underestimate the power of shaking. This is what happened to a room when scientists at UCSD simulated a 6.7 quake. That's as big as the Northridge quake of 1994. Let me show you here something, a myth that we're trying to dispel about standing in a doorway during a disaster. Doorways are no longer safe to stand in. Uh, there's, the door itself is a hazard because the door can swing violently and slam and knock you clear out of the doorway or even slam your fingers or so forth. So doorways are not a safe place to take cover during an earthquake. I've always told my kids, first thing you do is you run for that door jam. So that's completely a myth. That's you completely that. a myth now. We, our recommended action is for you to drop cover and hold on under something sturdy, a sturdy table or desk. Okay, let's review. Move furniture away from windows. Secure things on shelves and pictures on walls. And don't forget to strap down computers and big TVs too. Contrary to popular belief, don't stand in a doorway. Drop, cover, and hold onto a table or desk. And find protection where you are. If you're inside, stay inside. If you're outside, stay outside. All right, we're going into the kitchen now to see what hazards we can find in here. Um, one of the things that I'd like to point out, first of all, is that your kitchen cabinets should have some type of safety latches on them because what will happen with an earthquake happening Look at all of this. All of this could come out, fall all over the floor. Boy, you'll have a terrible mess after a disaster if you have to clean up all of this stuff. But a very easy solution is to put those little child safety latches on here so that it'll keep it from opening all the way and it'll keep your things in the inside there. Uh, another thing, um, some other hazards in the kitchen here, of course, are, is a stove where you'll have, pot, you have pots and pans, cooking food and so forth. Uh, this is a danger area. You'll always want to get away from this area when something happens happens so that you can't be burned or uh, injured from things falling. Also, you've got some knives here that could fly out of here and you certainly don't want to be no. hit by one of these knives. Boy, that's really danger. So those types of things are dangerous things in the kitchen to watch out for and to be aware of. Some helpful tips for you for using your food. Use the food in your refrigerator first, um, then use the food in your freezer. What would you think uh, we could go with how long before we can eat like the, the food in the refrigerator? Well, the food in the refrigerator will last a couple days. Then the freezer should last um, maybe three or four days as okay. well. Uh, if you keep your freezer and your refrigerator closed, it will help to, your food to last longer. The next thing you want to use is your canned food. This is, you've got quite a collection here, which is good. You use canned food after your food in your refrigerator and freezer. But if you do use that, make sure you have a manual can opener because remember, power will be out and you won't be able to use your electric can opener. So a manual can opener to go with your food. And this is the last source of food that you would want to use after a disaster. And also in this area, I just wanted to point out some uh, places where you can take cover. But one thing first is the glass window here. This is a hazard as well. So one, but one thing you can do to help that is to put safety film on the glass so that it will shatter, but it won't come out like in daggers. So you would want to consider doing that. And then a safe place, we recommend that you get out of the kitchen. It's just so many hazards in the kitchen until you won't want to take cover in the kitchen. But go to a place nearby, which would, and this is a really good breakfast bar area to take cover under, drop cover and hold on under here. And uh, this would, should provide you with enough cover for this area. I love candles and I have them all over the house, so wouldn't it be great to just have them in case of a power outage? Well, we don't recommend candles and the reason for that is that during an earthquake or the aftershocks that occur, um, the candles can fall over. 
calls a fire and then your your phones will be out you won't be able to call 911 so then what you'll have a fire that's caused unnecessarily so we recommend that you have a flashlight with extra batteries a solar powered flashlight something like that to um, help you to see after the earthquake it makes sense so in short move quickly out of kitchens because they're full of hazards put safety locks on your cupboards after a quake, if power's out, eat the food in your fridge first, it's most perishable. Then food in your freezer, and then canned food and non-perishables last. Okay, now if you're in your room, you're asleep in bed, and the earthquake starts happening, what you want to do is stay in the bed, cover your head with all of your pillows. You've got some beautiful pillows here, put them over your head, pull up the covers up over you, and but most importantly, stay in bed until the shaking stops. Then when the shaking stops, Get your sturdy shoes, which should be already under your bed, and your flashlight. Oh, like so I don't step on any of the broken glass if the mirror breaks. That's exactly right. The sturdy shoes will protect your feet. Uh, get your flashlight so you can see what glass is already down and whatever hazards there are on the floor as well. This experiment from UCSD shows you how important it is not to put heavy objects over your bed. We see here that uh, your bed, like your other rooms, is away from the windows. You don't have any pictures or mirrors hanging over the bed, so that's great. Uh, one thing that I do notice is that you can, for bookcases like this that you have in your room, after they're secured to the shelf, you might also want to consider putting a bungee cord across here to keep the books in. Now, I understand that you are afraid of earthquakes. Well, my first earthquake, I was in the second grade and my mom and dad were um, out of town. So I was playing video games in the, um, t my room and then all of a sudden an earthquake happened. So I started crying, I ran to my sister and she was telling me that it's gonna, all gonna be all right and I felt a lot better and I've just been scared of them ever since. Oh, okay, well that's, I'm sorry to hear that, but you know what, because you're learning today what to do for an earthquake, hopefully the next time you'll know what to do and you'll be so much more relieved. So, if you're in bed during a quake, stay there and cover yourself with pillows and blankets. Keep shoes and a flashlight near your bed. Don't hang mirrors or pictures with glass over your bed and use bungee cords across bookshelves to keep items from falling. Okay, we're going to take a look now at your gas meter and see what we have. And I see here that you do have an adjustable wrench, which is great for turning off your gas. Uh, and you should only turn it off if you hear the gas leaking or smell it. Homeowners can also have installed an automatic gas shutoff valve. It's activated whenever there's an earthquake over a certain magnitude. That way you don't have to worry about gas leaks if you're not at home. Okay, now we're going to take a look at your water heater. Now we see that your water heater is properly strapped. You've got straps at the top, at the bottom, and that's excellent. And just one thing to remember is that your water heater contains uh, 30 to 50 gallons of good water, but if it falls over and breaks, you'll lose all that uh, extra source of water that you could have. What about pool water? What kind of use can we use with that? Well, pool water, if you use chemicals, you won't be able to drink it, but you can use it for other things, uh, for washing and uh, things like that. We also recommend that you know where all of your utility shutoffs are, including your water valve. And uh, you can turn that off just in case there's a big problem that you have identified, uh, know where it is, know how to do it as well. And if, if you should also realize that if your water is shut off, then you, your toilets won't flush. So it's a good idea to have some good old sturdy trash bags to line your toilets and use it that way. You can also use these same trash bags for picking up trash throughout the house uh, of debris that has fallen over. To summarize, keep a wrench near the gas valve and know how to turn it off if you smell gas. Or get an automatic shutoff valve installed. They usually cost between two and three hundred dollars. Make sure your water heater is strapped down. Know how to turn your main water off if there are any leaks. And keep plenty of trash bags around in case toilets aren't working. I think they did pretty well. Don't they you? did a fabulous job. Yes, they did. So I we hope we it was helpful. And I think we will be moving some furniture around to accommodate what's safer in the house for us. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Take care now. Yeah. Bye. Bye. See you later. So how do homes as structures do? Well, the main thing to remember is that your foundation should be in good shape. And if you've got a crawl space, make sure your home is bolted to the foundation and that the cripple walls are reinforced with shear walls, which are usually just boards of plywood. Your contractor can help you with that. 
But the good news overall is that homes do fairly well in earthquakes as Tom Heaton of Caltech explains. I've seen many buildings in earthquakes and in general I would say generally our, our wooden houses uh, do extremely well in earthquakes. Oh. Wooden houses are, uh, are very lightweight and uh, furthermore uh, they, a wooden house has to carry the contents of the house. Wooden house carries the same contents that a heavy brick building does so when we build our houses we build them strong enough that they have very little deflection. They actually do very well in earthquakes. And what about apartments? Three, two, one. Well, this life-size seven-story apartment building was constructed on a huge shaking table at UCSD. And as you can see, scientists found that if it's designed right, it can withstand a major jolt. And with every major quake, engineers and seismologists learn more and more, and codes and standards are upgraded. So that in general, the newer the building, the safer the building. One decision the Californians need to make is whether or not to buy earthquake insurance for their home. And of course, that means answering some important questions like how vulnerable is your home? Can you afford to repair major damage? And is the deductible worth it? Val spoke with Candace Miller from the Insurance Information Network of California for some answers. So Candace, you must get this question a lot. Homeowners in California, the average home is worth half a million dollars these days. Should they get earthquake insurance? Well, it really all depends. A lot of it has to do with your equity. How much did you put into that home? How much do you have in your home right now? We know this. While earthquake insurance may not be for everybody, far too few people have it. Only about 12% of Californians have earthquake insurance. That's incredibly low, 12%. Only 12%, and so many of us live on top of or very close to active earthquake faults. So what's the general rule? The more equity you have in your house, the more you should get insurance? Absolutely. The more you have to lose, the more you have to have a financial recovery plan for an earthquake. Now maybe that's earthquake insurance, maybe it's a nest egg that you've set aside, but you should have some financial plan. Now obviously if a home is especially vulnerable to earthquakes, if it's right on a fault, then that would be another reason to get quake insurance, but what other factors should you look at? There are a lot of things. Earthquakes are very complicated and it's an evolving science. Not only is it where the fault is, but what is the structure of your home? How mm -hmm. old is your home? Is it up to current building code standards? Is it made out of a wood frame? Is it brick and mortar? Fortunately, not too many homes in California mm -hmm. are. Uh, what sort of soil content do you have under your home? Are you on bedrock? Or are you on land that can liquefy, like we saw up in the San Francisco Bay Area during Loma Prieta? All of those things combine to, to set your actual risk of earthquake damage. Now, we did learn from Katrina that it was the flooding that did a huge amount of damage. And you know, the delta in uh, around Sacramento and the Bay Area, there's levees that could break and so forth. Are, we, are those homeowners at risk for the same kind of thing? Well, uh, they could be, absolutely. Flood insurance is different than homeowner insurance. Flood insurance is available through a federal program called the National Flood Insurance Program. And like earthquake insurance, it is not a part of your homeowner policy. You want to make sure you do an evaluation of your home every year because so many of us have taken that equity that we've developed and we've put in fancy kitchens or beautiful master Good baths, point. and if we haven't updated our insurance policy, if the unthinkable happens, we may not have enough insurance to get back those granite countertops, and you want those. <laughs> so it's very important to make sure you keep your insurance up to date. In short, the more equity you have in your home, the more you should consider earthquake insurance. If not, think about a nest egg, enough to cover major damage. Size up the vulnerability of your home, its age, structure, and the soil it's on. Remember, flood insurance is separate from earthquake insurance. And it's also good to get all your important financial papers together, bank account numbers and insurance policies, as part of your earthquake kit. Candace Miller with the Insurance Information Network of California. Great advice. Thank you so much. Thank you. When we come back, we'll take a look at how you can make your office safer if a quake hits. That's right after this short break. Hi, my name is Trevin Reese, and I am from Ready America, and we are the Disaster Supply Professionals. We've been in business for 25 years, 
and today I'm going to demonstrate on how we use all of our fastening products for your benefit in your home and keep your family safe. I want to show you guys how to demonstrate the fastening strap for the 40 inch flat screen TV. So the kit's going to come with two straps uh, right here that you can see uh, as well as uh, all the hardware necessary and our thumb locks that have the industrial strength adhesive. Um, so quickly I'm going to demonstrate for you guys how to install this. Uh, so take the washer and the screw, attach it right through here. And all, all the TVs have pre-drilled holes, so you can attach it simply right into here. And then you can tighten it down. And then you're going to want to take this thumb lock right here, simply attach it, lift the handle, slide it through, and then you can adjust it to any length that you have, um, that your cabinet is on, or the TV is on. And then we'll put it right here. Perfect. And you also want to make sure uh, you peel this off um, as simply as possible right here. And this is the adhesive that will go right onto the bottom here. And make sure you always want to press down and tighten it perfectly. And then also for added measure, we have our Quake Hold Putty. Uh, this is great to help extra secure your uh, TV down to the base. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take off a small portion of it and I'm going to roll it into a ball and set it right underneath the base. You want to do this to all four corners if possible to add for extra protection and then push down as tightly as possible and it will help to secure your TV. Hi everybody, I'm Val Zavala and I'll bet you're picking up quite a few valuable tips from our special presentation of Bracing for a Quake. It's brought to you by your public television station and it's one of the many important shows we're proud to bring you every single day. And I hope you'll show your appreciation by getting in touch with us and making your tax deductible contribution. We've got lots more vital information coming up. And right now I'd like you to meet our special guest from the California Earthquake Authority, Glenn Pomeroy. Glenn, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you, Val, and thank you for putting on this very important program. It is important where people are going to learn a whole lot in the next hour or so. Now a lot of people have not even heard of the California Earthquake Authority. I understand you came into being after the Northridge quake. So what does the authority do? Well we're an earthquake insurance company that's a not-for-profit company created by the state of California after Northridge. Uh, th that was a big earthquake. A lot of insurance claims uh, paid, a lot of losses in incurred most of insurance companies didn't want anything to do with earthquake insurance after that. So the state organized this not-for-profit earthquake insurance company to give Californians a place where they can get earthquake insurance that's affordable and available to them. And now let me put you on the spot a little bit. We just heard that a very small percentage of California homeowners actually have earthquake insurance. And when you ask Californians why they don't, they always say it's too expensive and the deductibles are too high. So what are you doing? How are you dealing with that? Yeah, well actually I think there was some truth in that a while ago. Not anymore. Uh, earthquake insurance used to be very expensive, especially after the Northridge earthquake when we all realized the, the extent of this risk. But over time we've been able to lower our rates. We've lowered rates 50 percent uh, since we've been wow. around. It costs half as much as it would have if we had not been able to lower those rates. Uh, we also, especially this year, rolled out all sorts of new coverage options. So now Californians really are in the driver's seat. They can choose the kind of coverage that meets their own needs and budget. It's much more flexible and much more affordable than it's ever been before. So people should check it out if they haven't looked at it for a while. Absolutely. That's great. Glenn, thank you so much. There's a lot more to talk about. And while you're watching and learning what to do before the next quake strikes, pick up the phone and support public TV in your town, because that's how we stay prepared. Your help makes all this possible. And when you reach out to partner with us, here's how we'll say thanks. Be prepared. That's your first line of defense in case of an earthquake. When you make a donation of $60 or a monthly contribution of $5, we'll thank you with a DVD copy of the show you're watching, Bracing for a Quake. This educational DVD has step-by-step -step instructions on what you and your family can do to prepare. Plus, it includes a bonus question and answer session with the California Earthquake Authority. Make a one-time donation of $96 or just $8 a month and we'll send you the Bracing for a Quake Earthquake Kit, which includes a first aid quick guide, whistle, emergency blanket, respirator, and much more. This kit is filled with vital emergency and personal items approved by the U.S. Coast Guard to better aid you in a disaster. Increase your donation to $120 or just $10 a month and you'll get both the earthquake kit and the DVD. 
Your generous support enables public television to continue bringing you informative and educational programs like Bracing for a Quake, a survival guide. Thank you. You know, it just takes a few moments to step up and support your public media source. And whether it's news, documentaries, arts and culture, health, travel, food, or important public service programs like the one you're watching right now, we depend on you to make it all happen. The information's right there on your screen. So please call or go online right now. And with us is Glenn Pomeroy from the California Earthquake Authority. You know, Glenn, people who rent apartments or own condos, they may think, oh, I don't need earthquake insurance because the building has it. So why should I worry about it? Are they wrong about that? They're wrong, yeah. It's a common myth that, that if you rent or, or own a condo, you're covered, but you're not. Uh, uh, a condominium association will buy coverage for the whole structure but provides no protection at all for the condominium unit owner and the stuff that that person has inside it. Same with someone who rents in an apartment complex. That person has no financial protection for everything they have inside their apartment. The only way to get that is through a condo earthquake insurance policy or a renter's earthquake insurance policy, cover their stuff that they own and give them valuable protection for what's called loss of use. If they have to live outside of that place for a while while it's being coin. fixed, the coverage kicks in and gives them financial protection to pay costs for the additional living expenses they're going to incur. So you can get coverage just for your what you own, your possessions. You That's don't have to get it for the structure if you're a renter? That's correct. In fact, oh. if you're a renter, you can only insure the things you own in your uh, apartment unit. Um, if you're a condo owner, you can insure only insure the things in your condo unit. You can't insure the whole condominium uh, structure. That's for the association That's to insure. Got it. So it's actually very customizable to people's situation. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, but good. it's a common misconception. Now here's another. If you've started thinking about creating your own earthquake plan, you might also be thinking, it's so much trouble, there's so many things I have to do, so much stuff I have to buy. Well, maybe, but look at this way. You do it only once and then you have peace of mind for a long, long time. It's kind of like supporting public TV. All it takes is one call or a few clicks and you help guarantee an uninterrupted flow of great programs. So take that one step right now and when you do, we'll return the favor. Here's how. Be prepared. That's your first line of defense in case of an earthquake. When you make a donation of $60 or a monthly contribution of $5, we'll thank you with a DVD copy of the show you're watching, Bracing for a Quake. This educational DVD has step-by-step -step instructions on what you and your family can do to prepare. Plus, it includes a bonus question and answer session with the California Earthquake Authority. Make a one-time donation of $96 or just $8 a month and we'll send you the Bracing for a Quake Earthquake Kit, which includes a first aid quick guide, whistle, emergency blanket, respirator, and much more. This kit is filled with vital emergency and personal items approved by the U.S. Coast Guard to better aid you in a disaster. Increase your donation to $120 or just $10 a month and you'll get both the Earthquake Kit and the DVD. Your generous support enables public television to continue bringing you informative and educational programs like Bracing for a Quake, a survival guide. Thank you. You know what I really like about this program is how it corrects all those myths about earthquakes. Don't stand in a doorway. Don't run outside. And forget about the so-called triangle of life. It does not exist. Here's another myth. If you don't support your public TV, no problem, someone else will. Uh-huh. Your support does matter, it's vital, it's the engine that drives everything we do. So don't wait for someone else to step up, make that call, we really appreciate it. And with me now is Glenn Pomeroy, he's with the California Earthquake Authority. Now the CEA supports a lot of earthquake research. We're in California, of course, and compared to 10 or 15 years ago, what have we learned? Well, we've learned a lot. Um, you know, California is home to two thirds of the nation's earthquake risk. So you have this concentration of, of knowledge in this state as well through the universities and other organizations and agencies. We all work together to continue to advance our knowledge about this really potentially devastating natural catastrophe. So we've learned more about where the risk is and what the probabilities are and we're learning more all the time and we're, we're also learning what we don't know and we know there are unknown faults that we need to keep studying and try to understand. We're also learning how to make building stock safer. Large commercial uh, buildings are built to a stronger code now than they used to be because of this research. We've learned how to make older homes safer by going in and retrofitting them with some fairly simple um, steps. Oh yes, that's the ones on the raised 
on the raised platform. That's exactly the, the right. Foundations. You go in underneath and, and put in some braces and bolts and you dramatically reduce the risk of that home toppling off its foundation. So we're learning more all the time. We're developing programs to, to help people um, uh, uh, get the job done, get a hold of that building contractor and get the work performed before the ground starts shaking. And it's really all because of the, the research that we've been able to support. So what's the big challenge that lies ahead? What does you still really have to accomplish? You know, tough question because there's so much that has yet to be done. We're, Big advancements are made every time there's a big earthquake because that's what focuses everyone's attention. And we learn and, so much. And we learn so much, and, and we've had a number of them over time here in California. Uh, but there's so much that has yet to be done. Uh, we're still working to make older structures uh, safer, and millions of homes in California need to be retrofitted, and we have to get at it. Uh, millions of homes in California have absolutely no financial protection for the damage they'll sustain uh, in a major earthquake. We've got to get more people insured. There's so many things we have to do. We have to keep teaching our kids what to do, drop, cover, and hold, and, you know, we just have to keep at it. Well, there is a lot more to do, and there's a lot more to explore and enjoy right here on your public media source. So remember, you are the reason for everything we do. So I hope you'll show your appreciation by getting in touch right now. Be proud of the work you make possible. And now, join us as we look at earthquake safety on the road and on the job Let's go back to Bracing for a Quake, a survival guide. You know, with so much traffic congestion these days, we spend a lot of time behind the wheel. So let's say you're on your way to work or school or maybe even shopping and an earthquake strikes. Would you know what to do? Well, we're here with Joyce Harris again to talk a little bit about what to do in the car. I guess it all starts here in the trunk, right? Yes, it does. Whenever there's a major uh, disaster, you you need to have supplies with you wherever you are, and especially in your car, because most of the time, if you're away from home, you'll be in your car. So there's a good possibility you might have to get out of your car and walk. Yes, that's exactly right. And if you do have to do that, it's very important to have a pair of sturdy shoes so that you can walk comfortably without too much hassle. Um, make sure you keep a pair of sturdy shoes in your car keep them in your trunk, and uh, it will help you be safer. An ounce of preparation? Is it worth a pound of cure? <laughs> so you've got your kit in your trunk, you're headed down the road, and an earthquake strikes. A lot of folks would be asking, what do I do then? Okay, the safest thing to do if you're in your car, you're driving, pull over to the side of the road and stop and set your parking brake. The main thing to do is to stay in your car because things may be falling around you and your car will be your cover and protect you from those hazards. Now, there's a lot of different conditions people might be driving in, the city, the country, or maybe even on a bridge. I imagine uh, there are some different things you should do in that regard. Yes, well, if you're in a, in a city, of course, you'll have other traffic around you, so you have to be really careful, but you still want to pull over as soon as you can and stop. Uh, because you don't know what hazards will be ahead of you that you may run into. The same thing for uh, uh, in a country road, uh, you have a little bit more leeway, but you still need to pull over and stop because you still don't know. On a bridge, you definitely want to pull over and stop because the bridge could collapse, and but you won't know that. There could be danger right ahead of you, so pull over and stop is your safest action in all cases. Joyce, of course, a distinct hazard along the roadside are power lines. Let's say you're driving down the road, earthquake happens, power line falls on your car, what should you do then? Well, your safest action is to stay inside of your car. Don't try to get out because if you, when you try to, when you touch the ground, you could be electrocuted uh, from a live power line that's on your car. So stay in your car until you can get help in getting the live wire off of your car. So remember, have an earthquake kit and some shoes in the trunk of your car. If an earthquake hits, pull over carefully, stop, set the parking brake, and wait. Stay in your car until the shaking stops. And if a power line has fallen, don't get out. Wait until someone can remove it safely. So we've taken a look at how to make our home safer, but we also spend a lot of time at work. That's right, Val. Have you ever thought about how to prepare your workplace for an earthquake? Joyce, we often don't think about just how much time we spend at work. There's a good likelihood an earthquake might hit while we're there, right? Yes, that's exactly right. And uh, we see that buildings such as this, or uh, brick buildings or unreinforced masonry, uh, need to be reinforced. And that's a good idea for you to check to see if that has been done or not at your work site. So how do you know if a building has been reinforced? Look for these square metal plates on the exterior. Most brick buildings are supposed to be reinforced, but not all of them are. In the quake that hit Paso Robles in 2003, many brick buildings collapsed. 
and brick chimneys are notorious for falling in a quake. So Joyce, knowing the age of the building where you work is pretty important, isn't it? Yes, it sure is. And, and somewhere around the 70s, uh, buildings were required to be retrofitted. So if you're uncertain about whether your building was one of those or not, you can check with your building manager or someone like that to find out for sure. And of course, even if you work in a newer building, there are hazards outside, right? Yes, there certainly are. Even newer buildings such as this one, uh, the glass can fall, bricks can also break and fall, facades from the building can come down, so you still have to be careful. Things to be aware of when you're outside, some things we should probably look at inside too, right? Yes. Let's take a look. Well, here's a typical cubicle that you find at many offices, but some hidden dangers here in an earthquake, right? Yes, there certainly are. Well, one of the first things I notice are the objects up across the filing area. If those should fall, they could hit you. Um, even glass such as this can fall over and break and be a danger. Pictures on the wall can also be a hazard, so they need to be um, secured to the wall so that they won't fall and cause injury to the person sitting right here at the desk. Another thing that you can do in your uh, workspace area is to secure your computer. These are very expensive items and uh, using Velcro or something like that, you can secure it to the table so that it won't fall off. Let's um, say you're sitting at your desk yes. and you feel the earth start to move underneath your feet. What should you do? The safest action is what we call drop, cover, and hold on. You'd want to drop under a sturdy table or desk such as this, drop down underneath, um, take cover there, hold on to the desk or furniture that you're taking cover under because if it starts to bounce across the room, which it may do in a very large earthquake, you can crawl right along with it and your cover will remain over you. Well, we walk around this office and it doesn't take long to find a hazard, does it? Joyce? No, not at all. Uh, this is one typical example. Look at this bookcase. It is not braced to the wall. If it should fall, it can create a hazard. It, if it falls that way, uh, where there's a door or, or a passageway, it could block your access and in, entrance into the area. Another hazard in the office are file cabinets. And as you can see, this could be a hazard because during the shaking of an earthquake, this uh, can flop back and forth. Also, the drawer itself can come out. The contents can spill onto the floor. Easily uh, come out. Easily there, come yeah. out. Other drawers can just open. And, and it's very dangerous because if you're in this area, you could be hit by any of these things coming out. And then it makes quite a mess on the floor as well. If this file cabinet were to fall over, it could also block doorways or uh, other ways for you to get out of the office. So that's a, a danger in the office as well. Uh, but another example of a file cabinet that might be OK is uh, a file cabinet of this type where the drawer is already locked. It's locked. Uh, yes, and, but just like this one over here, you need to make sure that both file cabinets are braced to the wall so that they won't fall over. So to review, be aware of unreinforced brick buildings. Note the age of the building you're in. At the office, secure any objects above your desk. Strap down your computer and other heavy objects. Bookcases should be attached to the wall. File cabinets should be locked if possible. And this can't be said enough. If a quake hits, drop, cover, and hold onto a table or desk. Well, Joyce, we've learned about the myth of standing in a doorway during an earthquake. I imagine there's some others, right? Yes, there certainly is. One, one myth that we're really trying to dispel is the theory about triangle of life. And what it is, the, the, the concept is that if you get near a tall object or something like that and, it's, and uh, get down, there's a, a, like a triangle area or a void space that would keep you safe. But that is certainly a myth because um, the safest action for people to take is to drop cover and hold on under their table or sturdy desk. And a lot of people forget about uh, conference rooms in a general office because they, they have beautiful tables and sturdy mm. tables that people can get under as well to take cover. Folks that have seen the triangle of life on the internet and heard about this theory should know that's not endorsed by folks here in the United States? Most definitely not. It's just like standing in the doorway. It's a myth and we do not uh, comply with that. So the shaking has stopped and you want to get out of the building? Yes. Use the elevator? No. Elevators are a no-no. Just like after a fire or after an earthquake, you never want to use an elevator because a power could go out and you could get trapped in the elevator. So use the stairway to exit the building. Uh, that's be, that will be your safest way to get out after the shaking has stopped. We've talked a lot about what to do around the office, but not every Everybody works in an office, so it's a good idea to know what your workplace has for an earthquake plan, right? Yes, that's certainly true. Every every office should have an emergency plan uh, so that you will know what, what 
actions they will take after a major disaster. Because you just remember, you may be stuck in your office for several days after the disaster. So you need to know, do they have plans for food and water and, and shelter, things like that. Uh, but every company should have that plan and you need to be familiar with it so that you can be safe after a major disaster. Good information, Joyce. I think folks will take it to heart. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. To reiterate, the so-called triangle of life is not advised or endorsed by safety experts. After the shaking stops, use stairs, not elevators, and familiarize yourself with your company's emergency plan. After an earthquake hits, one of the most important things, perhaps as important as food and water, is information. But how do we get that information quickly and reliably? Val talked with Bill Stout of the Orange County Chapter of the American Red Cross at their communication center in Santa Ana. So the first thing people want to know in an, in an earthquake or an emergency is what's happened? They want information. Where's the best place for people to go for good information? Well, they should have a portable radio as part of their emergency preparedness kit. Failing that, they, they typically would have a car radio that they can go turn on, sit in their car, listen to it. Um, all news stations are going to begin broadcasting immediately about the earthquake. If the internet's up and available, there are a variety of earthquake sites uh, online that can really give very uh, precise information about the earthquake location and its, and its shaking intensity so that uh, if it's available, people can go see that as well. But in a really big one, wouldn't power be out? Would radio stations be up? Would the internet be up? Well, uh, it's going to be spotty, probably, all over the place. Certainly, um, it's likely that radios are going to be available. Um, if, if, if nothing else, they have, as you know, um, redundancy transmitters mm -hmm. and the like, so, and, and power generators, so they're going to get a signal out. Um, failing that, it would just be just listening for information that may be coming over a broadcast speaker with uh, folks going through their neighborhood if indeed there's a really emergent condition that would require an evacuation or, or, or the like in that regard. But if you can't get to your car for some reason, you can't find a radio, there's this great gadget, right, that doesn't even require battery. That's right. It is a hand-powered radio, and there are a variety of them out on the market now, big to small. Mm -hmm. um, this one actually has a flashlight too, so uh -huh. batteries aren't required to make it work. So I'm going to just crank it for a little bit, and then I'm going to turn it on. And it works. It's, it's complete as that it is. That is great. Now there's a rumor going around, maybe it's a myth, that cell phones are more reliable during an earthquake than regular phones. Is that true? If the telephones are down, typically cell phones would be down as well if the public switch network isn't working. Also, just as with regular phones, cell phone, there's a, a limited number of calls that can be made. There's a limited bandwidth. Clearly, a, a message to everybody is that if you're, if you're not injured, if, you're, if you don't need to talk to somebody right away after the earthquake, simply don't. Uh, let emergency calls pass through. So, for the best information, tune into radio stations. Be alert for public announcements in your area. A hand crank radio is very useful. Cell phones are not reliable. Don't assume they'll work if the power is out. If power is working and there's a computer up, you can get the latest information on earthquakes at earthquake.usgs.gov. Now, Bill, one of the safest places we can actually be is just simply walking along a sidewalk, right, with not much over us? Right, there no, here there are no overhead power lines, which would otherwise be a concern. In a big earthquake, we would just want to move to the side so we wouldn't get tossed in the uh -huh. street, potentially. But yeah, absolutely safe. No high rises around us, so? Nope, good place to be. So just do more walking. Absolutely. Bill, if there's one thing Californians love to do is shop. So we do spend a lot of time in stores and malls. What if an earthquake hits and we're in you know, a mall like this? Like anywhere else in an earthquake, we just want to be aware of our surroundings and avoid dangerous falling objects. So if we were inside the mall, we'd want to get away from large plate glass windows. We'd want to be away from any obvious things that may be falling up on us if we're in a store or outside in terms of that the decorations, whatever might be there. We'd certainly just want to stay put after an earthquake and listen for instructions. Um, we don't want to rush towards exits because many people may be doing that and simply you, you don't want to be caught in that crush. Should our strategies be different whether we're inside or outside? You don't want to try and run out in the midst of the earthquake. If you're running and, the, and everything's shaking, you're likely to fall and, and really risk greater injury. So that's very important. People should not try to rush toward an exit or get out. You're better off if you're, especially on the second or third floor, stay put. Absolutely. 
So if the main danger is things falling on you, then being in an open parking lot like the one behind you is actually pretty safe, right? Absolutely. There's no overhanging wires. There's really nothing to fear in a covered parking lot that's multi-storied. Indeed, we can look back on the history of earthquakes in North Region, a variety of, of earthquakes. You can see that those have collapsed. Um, there's been a lot of retrofitting um, and certainly newer codes for newer structured parking lots are a lot better than they were. If I am in a covered parking lot and I'm concerned, I'm going to do it essentially deck and cover. I'm going to get next to a car, the biggest, strongest one I can find, and just get down low. So if something did fall, I've got the protection of the car above me. Or if you're really afraid of things, maybe you should just always park in an open air parking lot or the top level. Yep, or, <laughs> or internet shopping. <laughs> there you go. Okay, let's review. At a mall or a store, move away from windows or large signs, anything that can fall on you. Don't rush to the exits. Trying to navigate a store during the shaking is dangerous. Listen for instructions after the shaking stops. Or after it stops, move slowly to the exits. And if you're in a parking garage, duck next to a large vehicle for protection. So Bill, what should we do if we're in a crowd, like in a theater, a stadium, even a church, where there's a lot of people, but the, the seating is, is stationary? Ladies and gentlemen, the game has been called. Once again, we're going to stay put during the event itself, because trying to run during a big earthquake just leads to injury. Um, we can essentially drop and cover next to the seats. They're typically rather sturdy, so if there's a danger of something falling from above as an indoor in a church or an indoor theater, we can mitigate that by just having our, our heads lower than the seats. We're going to wait till the shaking stops and then figure out what's going to happen next. So talk a little bit about stores, because stores have changed a lot. We've got these big box warehouse stores with things stacked up in the ceiling. How should we approach them? Well, I think it, you want to be aware of the surroundings when you go in and understand that indeed stuff just becomes missiles in an earthquake. Certainly be aware of uh, perhaps an open area that you'd want to get to within the store, or in some cases just an area that you can duck into under, near a shelf so that you, if something is flying off a shelf or a nearby shelf, you have an opportunity to escape. And in general, it's just useful advice to know what the, your surroundings are in, in any of your locations. So you, that when you walk in, you can notice exits and know how you'd get out, roughly the distances that are involved, and just sort of scan for what could be an obstacle or uh, something that's going to become a missile, in, 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 in fact, in an earthquake. So you personally, as a disaster preparedness person, are very aware of what situation you're walking into, whether the building's old or new or three-story or one-story. You kind of have a little checklist in your head? Exactly. OK, once again, if you're in a stadium or a theater, stay put. Use the strong seats as protection. And mainly, be aware of your surroundings and think about how you'll respond if a quake should hit. And again, we go for years and years without that happening. Um, we get very complacent? Absolutely. I mean, with our preparedness at home, with our readiness at home, everything. But you just want to keep that in the back of your mind. What would happen now? Um, am, I, am I ready now to respond? Bill Stout with the Orange County Chapter of the Red Cross. Thank you so much. That's great advice. Absolutely. In our next segment, we take a look at making a plan for your community and what you should have in your earthquake kit. That's right after this important break. Now we're going to demonstrate our furniture safety strap. Here's what it's going to look like. These are great because they come in five different colors to match every type of furniture you will have. They are great to install on any bookshelves, anything with top heavy furniture. Um, really important to get these installed because um, kids play a lot around them. So you want to make sure that in the emergency, this is safe. So here real quick, we have the adhesive that's going to go onto the top. These are really great because it does not damage the furniture at all. And then, or you don't drill any holes into the furniture. And then we have the Velcro adhesive right here, and it's industrial strength, so it will prevent anything from falling and has a load capacity of about 400 pounds. So first to install this, we're simply going to want to find a stud in the wall. So we're going to find, get a stud finder, and then here we have a stud. So we're going to find that stud, and then we're going to take the furniture strap and the hardware, and we're simply going to install this right here and drill it in. All right, so after you finish the drilling, you're gonna to want to rotate the strap all the way up so it's vertical. 
and then you're going to want to peel off the top part right here and stick firmly on top of the cabinet. And that's how you install the furniture safety strap. Hello everyone. I hope you're enjoying our special presentation of Bracing for a Quake. I'm Val Zavala, along with Glenn Pomeroy, CEO of the California Earthquake Authority. Now let me ask you once again to just take a moment and show your support for this program and all the great programs that we bring you each and every day on the air and online. None of it happens without your help. But when you partner with us, we're able to continue our mission and bring you the very best in public media. So please get in touch right now. All you have to do is call or go online. Now, Glenn, I want to ask you about cell phones. We are completely dependent on cell phones these days. Some people even canceled their landline. So what do we do in case of an earthquake and our cell phones or even our landlines don't work? What will happen to cell phones in an earthquake? Well, you know what? The experts don't really know. Uh, main thing is don't put all your eggs in one basket. Cell phones are great. They, there's all sorts of notifications you can get about earthquakes that are occurring elsewhere. Technology is advancing, and someday we'll all be able to get a, a, a bit of a warning, five, ten-second warning, really, before the earthquake strikes. That's a ways off, but it's coming. But the main thing is have a plan in case all communications are down. Oh. If you don't have a landline, cell service is not available, uh, how are you going to connect with your loved ones? Have a plan in advance, really. Bake this into your earthquake preparedness mm. plan. Where are we going to connect uh, if, if uh, the phone service is out? Um, and, and just be ready for that contingency. Yeah, that is tricky because... How do, we, how do we communicate these days yeah. with it's not electronic? Right. I'm told that sometimes you can actually reach like relatives across the country when you cannot necessarily reach somebody across town. Yeah, but that's, that's, that's not, not a bad fallback plan too. But it may not be possible. Correct. So. Okay. Now, last year in Los Angeles, the city council ordered cell phone providers to actually strengthen their towers so they'll keep operating during a quake. But getting that done will take a lot of time. So what's the best strategy in the meantime? You know, again, I just really think it's a matter of having a backup plan. So mm -hmm. um, visualize what the, what the world's going to be like yeah. after a big earthquake when, the, when your neighborhood's been devastated. Um, what do you need to get by for the next 24, 48 hours? How are you going to communicate with people, your loved ones, maybe even people who live with you, if 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 you're not at home when the earthquake strikes? Uh, um, where are you going to meet? Uh, um, where are to, you going to meet? That's the main thing, right? So you're not crossing one going home, one going to work. That's right. Where are you going to meet? Right. That's really important. Right. And it doesn't take that long to sort of uh, have a conversation over dinner and sort of kind of figure it out and maybe commit it to writing and, and put it with your earthquake preparedness kit and uh, talk about it every now and then. Just be prepared. We don't need to live in fear in California. We know it's going to happen again. Uh, part of what makes California so beautiful is the faults that create this, you know, the, this geography. We don't need to live in fear. We just need to be prepared, and, and there's plenty of ways we can do more to, to be just prepared as can be. Great. Thank you so much. You know, more than ever, we rely on technology for so many things, so many things we take for granted. It's important to remember that all this technology needs a power source, and if a quake knocks out that power source, what then? Well, I hope this program is making an impression and helping you come up with that plan B. And I hope you also understand that when it comes to public TV, you are the power source. We need you. So please call or go online and support this station. And we'll say thank you with a very special gift. Be prepared. That's your first line of defense in case of an earthquake. When you make a donation of $60 or a monthly contribution of $5, we'll thank you with a DVD copy of the show you're watching, Bracing for a Quake. This educational DVD has step-by-step -step instructions on what you and your family can do to prepare. Plus, it includes a bonus question and answer session with the California Earthquake Authority. Make a one-time donation of $96 or just $8 a month, and we'll send you the Bracing for a Quake Earthquake Kit, which includes a first aid quick guide, whistle, emergency blanket, respirator, and much more. This kit is filled with vital emergency and personal items approved by the U.S. Coast Guard to better aid you in a disaster. Increase your donation to $120 or just $10 a month and you'll get both the earthquake kit and the DVD. Your generous support enables public television to continue bringing you informative and educational programs like Bracing for a Quake, a survival guide. Thank you. You know, this is really a win-win all around. You get a tax deduction plus your very own copy of this important program. Best of all, you partner with us to find and present vital and compelling public media. And whether it's news, public affairs, arts and culture, health, travel, we depend on you to support and make a lot of it possible. So I hope that you're getting in touch with us right now. 
You know, Glenn, believe it or not, it's been more than two decades since the Northridge quake. A lot of things have improved, but there's a lot of offices, homes that are not prepared. It's easy to get complacent, I guess. Is that what it is? Well, that's one reason why earthquakes are so dangerous. And not, not only can they be powerfully destructive, they, they just don't happen very often. And so we tend to put them out of sight, out of mind. It has been over 20 years. Could happen again this afternoon, but we're not constantly reminded. There's no like hurricane season uh, for mm, earthquakes. Good point. So um, it, it is so important that we continually remind ourselves we live in earthquake country. Scientists say it's gonna happen again, it's absolute certainty. Uh, a, a local expert recently said uh, the San Andreas Fault is locked, loaded, and ready to roll. Ooh. It's going to happen. That's not sky is falling talk. It's just talk saying, let's face reality. Uh, let's not live in fear. Let's, let's just get ready. You know, it's never a good idea just to let things slide. And that's why Bracing for a Quake is such a meaningful show. And we're proud to share it with you here on Public TV. And if you like, you can also have it right in your own home anytime you need a refresher course. It's easy to get a copy of this program for your own collection. All you have to do is get in touch with us and make a tax-deductible contribution. Take a look. Be prepared. That's your first line of defense in case of an earthquake. When you make a donation of $60 or a monthly contribution of $5, we'll thank you with a DVD copy of the show you're watching, Bracing for a Quake. This educational DVD has step-by-step -step instructions on what you and your family can do to prepare. Plus, it includes a bonus question and answer session with the California Earthquake Authority. Make a one-time donation of $96 or just $8 a month, and we'll send you the Bracing for a Quake Earthquake Kit, which includes a first aid quick guide, whistle, emergency blanket, respirator, and much more. This kit is filled with vital emergency and personal items approved by the U.S. Coast Guard to better aid you in a disaster. Increase your donation to $120 or just $10 a month and you'll get both the Earthquake Kit and the DVD. Your generous support enables public television to continue bringing you informative and educational programs like Bracing for a Quake, a survival guide. Thank you. We really do appreciate it when you contribute and when you tell us what quality public media means to you because we get it. We know how different we are. No one else maintains such a close connection with our audience and our communities. It's a real partnership and we're very proud of it. So I hope that you will call right now and keep this partnership going. Now, Glenn Pomeroy, you know, in a couple moments, we'll be going back to the program and to look to see what communities can do, what neighborhoods can do. And I know that you're out there advocating for better earthquake safety, but how do you deal with public officials or cities or counties that say, look, we have all these other needs, other priorities. Uh, we're not so sure about earthquake preparedness. Well, the reality is there are a lot of needs out there um, and, and, and public dollars are stretched to cover all sorts of needs. Uh, I think just it's incumbent upon all of us to re to just stay on message that but we live in earthquake country and we need to be prepared and we shouldn't expect government to do everything for us. There's a certain amount of personal responsibility that, that mm -hmm. goes along with living in this beautiful state as well. Make that home safe, uh, secure things to the walls and so forth so they don't fall down and kill people. Uh, have financial protection in place so you have the financial strength to rebuild. Uh, there are things that we can do personally while advocating for more public support more broadly, because we're all in this together and, and, and we all need to be better prepared. It's true, and I remember from having done this program that you don't actually need to depend on the city or the county. You can do a neighborhood preparedness, or you can work with your school or your library. So it doesn't have to be a huge citywide effort. People can get organized in smaller groups. That's exactly right, and, and we've seen in, in communities around the world, those communities that respond the best are, are those who do have sort of a neighborhood infrastructure in place. You know, when communication lines are down, when, when it's difficult for emergency response vehicles to get around quickly, neighbors helping neighbors, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the fastest way to respond. That is the best way. And so that's something we can all do. We don't have to wait for some government programs. That's right. So, you know, there really is no greater priority than public safety. And as you're about to see, you can help your community deal with earthquake challenges by getting involved. So I hope this program inspires you to do that, to help make sure that your schools, your neighborhoods, your public facilities are all up to speed. And I hope you've been inspired to support our work right here at your public media source. So give us a call and let's return now to Bracing for a Quake, a survival guide. Earthquakes can hit at any time and there's a good possibility that families will be separated. So what should parents do if they're at work and the kids are at school? 
been a firefighter in my hometown in Sierra Madre. Val Zavala talked with Bob Spears, Director of Emergency Services for the Los Angeles Unified School District. Bob Spears, a lot of parents are going to be at work or at home, miles away, their kids going to be at school, and they're going to be very, very worried. They're going to want to get to school as quickly as they can. What's your advice to parents? First thing the parents should know is that they shouldn't panic, and they should not uh, risk their safety or the safety of others trying to get to the school because they feel that they're worried about their child. They need to know that the school has a plan, the school is prepared to shelter the children and protect them until the parent can get there. You're not going to let them off campus we're not unless... Gonna we're not going to dismiss them, we're not going to let them out into the community because okay. we don't know that there is a custodial parent there to, to at, home. at home. And that's why parents really need to take this emergency information card very seriously. Absolutely. This is the parent's way of telling us who can pick up their child, who is authorized to take their child off campus. We don't know until the parent tells us. And it's a state law that each school has to have an emergency plan? That's correct. Every school in California has to have an emergency plan. Twice a year, we, we drill with it. We make the schools go through emergency drills in addition to their fire drills and everything else so that they practice what's in the plan. Communications is really important and that's what you've got here all ready to go on wheels. In the Los Angeles Unified School District, every secondary school, that's a middle school or high school, has a base station that they can use to contact school police directly. So if the power is out phones and the are phones out. are out, they can call school police and get assistance. In addition, every elementary school has a handheld radio that they can use to call the local secondary school. Plus, we also put together uh, boxes for the emergency operations center at the school so they can have their uh, a package of all the information and all the supplies they will need to run the emergency and also all the stuff for the request and reunion gates. So when it comes to schools, remember, state law requires that all school districts have an emergency plan. Schools will protect students. And that emergency information card is important. Make sure you list all the people who are authorized to pick up your children. It's one thing to have a plan on paper. It's another thing to have supplies. Bob Spears showed me a half a dozen big bins full of survival gear. So Bob, this is one of, what, four supply bins? This is more than a bin, it's a shed. We need to store a lot of supplies because in Los Angeles Unified School District, what we try to do is make sure that every school has enough supplies on hand to shelter the kids for three days. That includes blankets, first aid kits, flashlights, and cards and games to keep the kids occupied, as well as search and rescue equipment like gloves, helmets, and dust masks. We also have water. A lot of water. We this have is the lots main thing, right? It th takes this up the takes most up space. the most space. We have toilets. Toilets. Very important. Because we know the kids yeah. are going to have to go to the bathroom that after the earthquake. That doesn't stop. <laughs> and that does, that's not going to stop. And we have this these cool. privacy shelters so that when we have to set up a toilet or a latrine operation out on a field, we can uh -huh. set this up and we can, we can be ready to go. You've really thought of everything here. Now, yeah. are, are most schools as pre well prepared or should parents check with each school to see? Parents should what check they're... with the schools. Okay. In California, we have the Field Act. And the Field Act says schools will be built to a higher standard okay, and be inspected more often. And that means that when you are in a school, you are, should be in a pretty safe place. Now, that doesn't mean the building is perfect. Right. What we expect is to have the building shift so there might be like a door that doesn't open. So one of the first things we do after an earthquake is we evacuate the building, we get kids away from the building and its content, and we start lining them up and counting who's here and who's out not. Out in the open somewhere. Out in the open, away from the school. So you'll see them out on the football field, you know, away from the school. And then if somebody can't open their door, we send search and rescue teams in to open a door, open a window so the kids can get out. But the buildings, we want parents to understand that the buildings, even the little bungalows, are designed not to collapse and not to fail. Okay? So they should have a sense of confidence knowing that the children are safer at school. Once you have all the students out on the field, uh -huh. you have to run your school and account for everyone. And that takes a certain amount of documentation. Now we expect right. the power to be out so all those computer computer files won't be available. That's right. So what we do is we have the schools store oh, the this. printouts of all the students and oh. where they are and all the all their contact information, all their parents, everything that they would need so that if somebody came up and said where's my child and what's going on, 
they can find them. You can get organized, you check everybody off You can get organized and get everybody off. Otherwise, Excellent. you know, you have to rely on memory and things like that. That's, and that's right. We don't, want to, we don't want to overlook anyone. So remember, the FIELD Act requires that all California schools be built to a higher standard. And be sure to check with your local school district to find out what their particular policies are in case of a quake. Bob Spears, that's great information. I hope all the schools in California are as well prepared as you are. Thank you very much for coming. I'm, we're glad to share it with you. Okay, you've got your water supply and your home secured, but there's something else that's just as important, a plan of action for your family. Our earthquake preparedness expert, Joyce Harris, sat down with the Martinez family to give them some tips. For an emergency plan, some of the things that you would want to include is uh, you need to have a place to meet in case your home is damaged. So you need to have a, a couple of choices to go to alternate meeting sites. You need to have an evacuation plan in case you have to evacuate your home altogether and go to a different area. You need to have an out-of-state contact person's name and number. Each family member should have that contact person's name because after a major disaster, the uh, power will be out. You won't be able to call in the immediate area. But if each person has uh, the name of their out-of-state contact person, if you're separated into some other areas, you can call your out-of-state contact person and let them know that you're safe, where you are, and then as each person calls to that person, they'll know where all of you are at. Know the policies of your children's schools. Make sure that your emergency cards are updated and that um, the school will know what, you're, what you want, to, want them to know. To sum up, have an evacuation plan for your home. Designate an out-of-state person that everyone can call after a quake. And parents, be sure to know the emergency plans and policies at your children's schools. So there's a basic rule. First take care of yourself, then your family, and then your neighbors. So how do you go about devising a plan for your community? Val Zavala met with Captain Stacy Gerlich of the Los Angeles Fire Department to find out more about how neighborhoods can prepare for an earthquake. So Captain Gerlich, if a community wants to get its act together in terms of emergency preparedness, where might a good place to start be? Uh, you know, there's a lot of different places. Probably one of the best places is with your fire department to find out if there's a program because there is uh, a program out there now. It's nationwide. It's called Community Emergency Response Training. And again, that's in all 50 states, seven foreign countries. Wow. So that's probably the best place for someone to start. And or... that stands for Community Emergency Response Team, CERT? Yes, mm -hmm. CERT. What would a person learn if I were to sign up and say, okay, I want to get CERT tra training, what would I learn? You're going to learn basic information on how to prepare for disasters. So it'll cover earthquake, fire, flood, uh, hurricane, tornado, um, anything, any natural disaster, anything like that. Do I learn CPR? You will learn CPR. Mm -hmm. um, not every department will offer that, but uh, certain ones will. And then you'll learn fire suppression, how to put out a fire with a fire extinguisher. You'll learn mm -hmm. triage, how oh. to differentiate between who you can save and who you can't. You'll learn bandaging and splinting, search and rescue operations, uh, incident command system, a little bit about disaster psychology, and then weapons of mass destruction or terrorism awareness training. Now it's hard enough to get individuals and families to get all their water and everything together, but it sounds even more unusual for a neighborhood or a community to get itself together for earthquake preparedness. I think it was you know, years ago it was sort of unusual, but I don't think it's as unusual anymore because people are understanding that um, they're going to be on their own. I mean, you know, your first responding agencies, police and fire, are going to be there, but we tell them really 72 hours on their own. So I think that kind of gets them thinking, you know, maybe we do need to do a little bit more, be more prepared. Um, and so we're seeing that more and more neighborhoods now are coming together with these councils and they're, they're getting more and more people trained in the CERT program and they're actually putting things together. So to reiterate, if you want to put a community plan together, a good place to start is your local fire department. You can also contact the Red Cross at redcross.org. And if you'd like to be CERT trained, you can go to citizencorps.gov slash CERT. So Captain Gerlich, you've been working with this neighborhood here in Van Nuys. Right. To uh, get their emergency response together on a community level. Correct. And I'm going to introduce you to Linda Pruitt. Linda's the Vice President of the West Van Nuys Lake Balboa Neighborhood Council. Oh. So Linda, we're in this park because this is one possible place where the community might store a lot of its emergency supplies? That's correct. Louise Park is one of the sites we're looking at to set up a command post and for bins with storage of emergency preparedness supplies. And why would you pick a park? 
Well, it's easily accessible to the entire community, mm -hmm. and that's what we're looking for. So after your organization, it could be a neighborhood council or a neighborhood watch group, after your organization decides it wants to do this, so how do you go about it? What we did was to form several subcommittees from our regular oversight committee, EP mm -hmm. oversight committee. We have a strategy committee, we have a supplies committee, we had a location and storage committee, and we also have a communications, education, and training committee as well. So Linda, this is one of the locations that you're considering for the supply bin? Yes, this is a possible location. We're also looking at a golf course and also on the grounds of a couple of elementary schools as well because they too have expressed interest in having emergency preparedness supplies close by. So it doesn't take much room. I mean, this is what, 20 by 20 at most? Yes. That's right. And this, um, the bins themselves are about 20 feet long, eight and a half high, eight feet wide. So you can put a lot of supplies in a relatively small area. And it'll be secure and safe and there when you need it. Absolutely. Great. In short, consider a park, golf course, or school campus as a staging place for your community aid. Equip your community disaster kit with search and rescue equipment, communication equipment, as well as first aid supplies. And I imagine there's a lot of people who live alone or the elderly who need help beyond just themselves, who can't just help themselves. Absolutely. For example, people who live in apartments and condominiums don't necessarily have the space to store all the things that's going to be necessary. Um, as you mentioned, the elderly, the disabled, even infants. We have to think about those people who won't very well be able to get by 24, 36, 48, 72 hours without so, extra help. So remember, know the elderly or disabled in your area who may need special help. And it's also a good idea to take an inventory of your neighbor's skills, everyone from doctors and nurses to carpenters and plumbers. So in the end, we're all going to end up helping each other, we hope. That's the plan, <laughs> definitely. Linda Pruitt, thank you so much for great advice. Thank you for having me today. We've been talking a lot about earthquake kits in this program, but what exactly does a good earthquake kit contain? Val talked to Joyce Harris to get some answers. The most important item, of course, is emergency drinking water. Uh, you can survive for several days without food, but not without water. So that's one of your most important uh, items. Now you'll you can, need more than that. You'll need more than that. But that pa little packet of water has a five-year shelf life, and so does the, the containers like this. They also have the same thing. Uh, but you can buy bottled water. Whatever kind you want to get, it's perfectly fine. We recommend that you have uh, the quantity that you should have is one gallon per person per day um, of per drinking water. Uh, and. Um, Make sure you keep that in your kit and at home, at work, and in your car. Um, another item, of course, is, emer is food, emergency food. We recommend that you get food that's, that's non-perishable. Uh, canned food is good or any type of food that uh, is non-perishable. And also be sure to include some snacks that you normally eat and you like so that you can be, feel comfortable. Other important things a kit should contain are a flashlight and extra batteries and a battery-operated radio. Light sticks are handy. And you should also include duct tape, string, a whistle in case you're trapped somewhere, a can opener, and a wrench to turn off the gas valve. You might also consider packing any prescription medicines you need. Another thing to have is an emergency blanket. Um, now people won't believe this, but this <laughs> is a blanket. Yes, it is, and it opens to a full-size blanket. It keep, it's, it, you can keep, use it for heat or for, for uh, uh, the cold. Another important thing is a first aid kit with a manual. Um, after a major disaster, communications will be out. You won't be able to call 911 or anybody else for that matter to come and help you. So you'll have to be able to uh, take care of those minor injuries on your own. Um, so you'll need to have a first aid kit and manual. Another thing we recommend is for everyone to take first aid training now. Don't wait until something's happened because you may be the one who will have to help those at work, at school, at the mall, wherever you are. You don't know where you're going to be, so wherever you are, you may be have, to, have to be the one who will have to help those people in the, by administering first aid. Now this is a great little gadget. Oh yes it is. Tell people about this. This is a safety light and the way it works is that you plug it into your, your uh, outlet you just leave it there all the time. Uh, when an emergency happens or the power goes out, the light comes on. 
and stays on for, for a few hours, and this could be used as a flashlight. You have to have some emergency cash as well. An emergency, part of your kit. Part of your kit should also include emergency cash because uh, banks will be damaged, ATMs will be out, so you have to have emergency cash to buy necessary supplies or where, so whatever you may need. So a couple hundred dollars or whatever yes. you can afford, put it yeah, in. Yeah, and small bills and, uh, and some coins. Now, an earthquake kit shouldn't just be at home. It should be at your office, in your car, wherever you might get stuck, really. We recommend at home, at least a couple places in the home, not just in one location, oh. maybe inside in a closet, maybe outside in your garage or somewhere else uh, within the house. So uh, emergency supplies at work or at school are also recommended. And you can buy kits already made up. Yes, you can. You can buy kits already made up, or you can go and, and do this on your own. And that's one way that we recommend it through our emergency survival program is, is to purchase a different item each month as an easier way to get prepared. And just a final note, you know, a lot of people are very afraid of earthquakes, and other people and are kind of blasé. I mean, put it in perspective. Earthquakes are a way of life here. Yes. But they are not nearly as fatal as some natural disasters, hurricanes or tornadoes and, and other things actually can kill more people, right? So if we're prepared, chances are we're going to be okay because the fatality rates aren't always that Yes, high. and that, that's right. And uh, we, we know that earthquakes happen and we know that they happen without warning. We know that in, here in Southern California, there's over 300 faults that run throughout the area. So, and we know that earthquakes happen every day. Usually they're very small. We don't even feel them, but um, it is something that we can live with. If you need one last reason to get ready for a quake, think of this. If you're prepared for an earthquake, you're prepared for virtually any natural disaster that may come our way. And there's no better way to reduce the fear of a quake or disaster than to make sure you, your family, and your neighbors are prepared. So we hope you found this program helpful. I'm Val Zavala from KCET Public Television in Los Angeles. And I'm Jason Schultz from KVIE Public Television in Sacramento. Thanks for joining us for Bracing for a Quake, a survival guide. I'm Jeff Primes with Quakehold and we're in the Big Shaker, the world's largest mobile earthquake simulator. This is uh, built out to look like the inside of your living room and just like in your living room we have uh, home electronics um, which are fastened with Quakehold fastening straps. You can see uh, demonstrated here. Um, these are readily available in your local hardware home improvement stores. For all your collectibles, glasses that will fall off the shelf and become projectiles in an earthquake, um, these can be fastened with Quakehold Museum putty or museum wax or gel that will firmly attach uh, your treasured valuables to the shelf so that they don't become projectiles uh, and damage you or uh, the contents uh, in an earthquake. For your artwork and picture frames, these are attached to the wall um, with the amazing picture hook which captures the uh, wire on the hook um, as you can see in a maze so it won't jump off the wall and create both uh, damage and uh, broken glass which would impair your exit uh, in an earthquake. Very important for your furniture um, that you fasten that to the wall especially tall for anything that's uh, over about three foot tall. Um, these are fastened with quake, with quake hold furniture straps which just are peel and stick to the furniture and then screw into the stud of the wall. For your uh, electronics, um, we have uh, flat screen fastening straps. Most of the televisions today are very tall and top heavy uh, and will topple over easily. So to protect yourself in an earthquake or for children crawling on uh, to televisions to fasten them, um, very important that that be, that that be secured uh, with uh, inexpensive straps. So uh, let's give the Big Shaker a, a little tour here, put uh, the products to the test.
Hello again, I'm Val Zavala with Glenn Pomeroy of the California Earthquake Authority. And you know, watching this last segment and seeing how LA Unified, for example, makes sure that every school is prepared right down to having printed records for every student in case the computers go down and all the supplies, water, food, those makeshift bathrooms, it makes you realize none of this is easy, but it's all essential. I really hope that this program motivates you to take action in your home, at work, in your neighborhood. And I hope it inspires you to support the work that we do right here by giving us a call. Now, Glenn, every disaster, whether it's an earthquake, a flood, or tornado, or whatever, inevitably we hear the horror stories about how long it took for people to get assistance, often government assistance. What is CEA doing about that, and how can homeowners speed up the process? Well, it's a great question. It addresses another common myth that, oh, if the disaster's too big, I don't have to worry about it because the government will come in and make everything fine again. Mm -hmm. But we see time and time again that that's not the case. There is government assistance that, avail that is available after a major disaster, uh, but it's limited. Uh, the, the maximum amount you can get from FEMA in a disaster grant is $32,000, and the average is more like three or 4000 So that's not going to repair someone's uh, uh, condition and get them back yeah. up and running. Uh, and it takes a while to get. The de presidential declaration has to be declared and paperwork has to be submitted. One great advantage of having an earthquake insurance policy from the nonprofit California Earthquake Authority because you can get, uh, with no deductible whatsoever, uh, uh, money to repair for uh, make emergency repairs, uh, money to live elsewhere if you if you can't live in your home, uh, it's called additional living expense coverage, and and that's a benefit that comes with no deductible whatsoever. Wow. So first dollar right away assistance to get people back up on their feet. That's why it's so important to have your own financial protection plan in place and not rely on a uh, government bailout. That's really, really good advice. If you've got the policy, the bureaucracy can, can start moving much more quickly. Absolutely. Much more quickly. And we should mention, as you mentioned before, that it's been restructured, there's a lot more choice, customizable options, and those uh, premiums have been coming way down. Yeah, so. it's a different day now with the California Earthquake Authority. I don't blame people if, if they have a conception based on looking at it years ago, that earthquake insurance cost too much. It, it was, used to be very expensive. At that expensive. time it did. Now we've lowered our rates substantially. We've offered so many more options for people to choose from. Now they can choose the kind of coverage that meets their needs and budget. Uh, um, and so it really uh, important for everyone in earthquake country to give it a careful look. Jump on our website, go to earthquakeauthority.com, mm. check out that premium calculator and, and find the policy that's right for you. Great advice. So time to relook at right. earthquake insurance. Yep. You know, every one of us can do our part to be prepared and to keep ourselves safe, and every one of us can help keep this wonderful public television station on the air. Remember, we don't answer to anyone but you. That's our agenda, to bring you programs that you want to see. So take a moment and let us know that you appreciate that. And when you do, we'll return the favor. Take a look. Be prepared. That's your first line of defense in case of an earthquake. When you make a donation of $60 or a monthly contribution of $5, we'll thank you with a DVD copy of the show you're watching, Bracing for a Quake. This educational DVD has step-by-step -step instructions on what you and your family can do to prepare. Plus, it includes a bonus question and answer session with the California Earthquake Authority. Make a one-time donation of $96 or just $8 a month, and we'll send you the Bracing for a Quake Earthquake Kit, which includes a first aid quick guide, whistle, emergency blanket, respirator, and much more. This kit is filled with vital emergency and personal items approved by the U.S. Coast Guard to better aid you in a disaster. Increase your donation to $120 or just $10 a month and you'll get both the earthquake kit and the DVD. Your generous support enables public television to continue bringing you informative and educational programs like Bracing for a Quake, a survival guide. Thank you. Just a moment of your time and a small commitment to help keep quality programs going strong. So pick up the phone or go online and help us continue this mission. You know, Glenn, the neighborhood organizers that we heard from, she talked about the elderly, people living alone, and that brings up another question. Putting these kits together and getting ready is not an inexpensive proposition. It can cost some money. Is there help out there? to help people get ready for earthquakes? There really is. You know, if, if someone's interested in securing their place, uh, they can either head to the hardware store and, and walk around and, and, and pick up some putty to put behind the picture frames and right. that sort of thing. Um, they call the American Red Cross, uh, which oftentimes is out there uh, with, with materials to help people oh. uh, take basic steps to make their place more secure. Um, I, I think people would be surprised to, to find that with some pretty simple steps, fairly low cost, can really 
dramatically lower the, the, the risk of getting hurt badly in an earthquake. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it, it, it's an investment that's worth it if a person can afford it. And if not, Red Cross or other organizations here locally uh, um, can try to help. Can provide some help? Yeah. That would be great. You know, it takes a lot of money, of course, to keep a public TV station going as well. But what it really takes is people, people just like you. And you don't have to carry the load all by yourself. If each person watching us right now joined this public TV station at any level, what an incredible difference that would make. So now it's up to you. We need your support to keep on bringing you the very best documentaries, news, health, public affairs, culture, travel, food, and so many other quality programs. Let's do it together. Give us a call or go online and take action. Support public media. And here's how we'll say thank you. Be prepared. That's your first line of defense in case of an earthquake. When you make a donation of $60 or a monthly contribution of $5, we'll thank you with a DVD copy of the show you're watching, Bracing for a Quake. This educational DVD has step-by-step -step instructions on what you and your family can do to prepare. Plus, it includes a bonus question and answer session with the California Earthquake Authority. Make a one-time donation of $96 or just $8 a month and we'll send you the Bracing for a Quake Earthquake Kit, which includes a first aid quick guide, whistle, emergency blanket, respirator, and much more. This kit is filled with vital emergency and personal items approved by the U.S. Coast Guard to better aid you in a disaster. Increase your donation to $120 or just $10 a month and you'll get both the Earthquake Kit and the DVD. Your generous support enables public television to continue bringing you informative and educational programs like Bracing for a Quake, a survival guide. Thank you. And as we said right at the beginning of our time together, this is California. Earthquakes are a fact of life, and sooner or later, we're all going to have to deal with the effects of the next one. Programs like Bracing for a Quake provide some of the information we need to make intelligent decisions, and that's why supporting public media is so important. In our final moments together, I hope you'll step up and let us know you believe in what we're doing. And now, Glenn, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you one more question. What does your personal earthquake preparedness kit look like? Well, I'll tell you, um, it's one of those plastic tubs yeah. with a secure lid. Yeah. Um, got some stuff in there, some, some non-perishable food like mac and cheese or, or noodles. Uh, water, a couple of gallons of water uh, nearby. Flashlight with batteries, candles. The thing to do is just sit down and think about, what if I need to live in my home for two or three days with no utilities? Make yourself a little list, pick them up, put them in the bin, and uh, know where it's stored in the garage, and you're ready. You're ready. That's a good way to think about it. What would I need if I didn't have any help? I had to be on my own or out camping for a few days. That's right. Thank you so much. It's just been great having you with us. Thanks for this important program. Great being here. And we're going to have to leave it at that, but I'd like to thank, as I said, Glenn Pomeroy with the California Earthquake Authority for making today's production possible and for being with me here in studio. You know, it's great information, very helpful. Also, a big thank you to Bud Darling at Safe and Ready, a store in Pasadena, for he supplied all these great earthquake kit items that you should think about having yourself in case a uh, disaster hits. And thank you, of course, our viewers for being with us, for all the support you've given us for so many years and for taking the time today to help us go forward. We truly appreciate it. I'm Val Zavala. We'll see you next time.